Save at the End of Time is mostly an homage to all of the great British visionaries of the 19th and 20th centuries. So starting out with uh, George MacDonald and going to Lewis Carroll and then moving on to H.G. Wells and then to William Hope Hodgson and to Olaf Stapledon and Arthur C. Clarke on up through the group we have now. Along the way, you also had scientists like J.D. Burnell. And what these guys all did was, for some reason, maybe it was something in the water, that, that you know limestone filtration system or whatever, the marl, somehow these guys all managed to want to think about very, very interesting either puzzles, psychologies, or by the time you get to Wells, the far future. And the far future became the great concern of British visionaries through the 1950s and 1960s and still to this day. We've got a whole crop of writers who are of UK descent at least who uh, are great at doing the far future hard science fiction or at least the very far future science fiction. And I was raised on that stuff. When I was a teenager, I picked up, uh, of course, Arthur Clarke and H.G. Wells and read all of that. And then I picked up a book called The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodgson. And his con contribution was more Irish-flavored. It was visionary. He was obviously sort of competing with H.G. Wells. But he was really taking it from what would almost become a horror slant later on. So House on the Borderland is now a classic of so-called supernatural literature. But in the end, the main character, I'm not spoiling anything by telling you this, the main character goes off on a cosmic voyage that takes him to the end of time and back. And in that time period, he gets to see many amazing things. That's obviously Hodgson saying to H.G. Wells, top this, sir. Now, Wells never really did much about the very, very far future except in the time machine. In the time machine, when he wrote that book, they were thinking the stars would all burn out within a few million years because they didn't know about fusion or nuclear energy. And so he set his very far future 860-some thousand years in the future. And he showed you, as the time machine moves forward, the heat death of the Earth, the last creatures on Earth, the giant red dwarf, giant red planet, a star that's the sun. Well, that's a very, very cool. Knocked people's socks off. Became a huge bestseller. And so writers really felt they had to compete with Wells. And along the way, they'd up the ante. By the time you get to 1929, you have a scientist, 27 years old. His name is J.D. Bernal. He's going to become a well-known scientist, but he writes a book called The World of Flesh and the Devil. And lo and behold, this book, very little read nowadays, lays down most of the tropes of the 20th century imaginative literature. He, for example, is probably the first person to mention Generation Starships. He's the first person to kind of talk about something that will become the Dyson Sphere later on. Of course, the Dyson Sphere isn't really a sphere, as, as uh, Freeman has pointed out. It's just a bunch of asteroids in a sphere. You know, it's not all connected, not one solid shell. All of these ideas, plus many, many, many more. And then a fellow comes along named Olaf Stapledon, William Olaf Stapledon. Now, I don't know what Mr. Stapledon was drinking, but he wrote at least five highly influential books, and the first two were Last and First Men. Now, he also wrote philosophy, but we're talking about his fiction works now. Last and First Men, published in 1930, and Last Men in London, I think, in 32, and then a book in 1935 called Star Maker. Now, Last and First Men was also a pretty good-selling book, even though it was not really a novel, it was a history. It was a history of the human race through 18 different species and 2 billion years of future time. Taken from the point of view of a far future descendant of humanity that is sending these messages back to a writer in our time. So you go all the way to the end of the human species on Neptune. And along the way, you find out that Mr. Stapledon is inventing all sorts of things to explain how you can live on a high-gravity planet like Neptune. Well, you must be made of artificial matter. This is 1930. You know, what the heck is artificial matter? He doesn't really explain it, but he seems to know that there's something going on. Is it, is it like carbon nanotubes? Is it, you know, bosonic matter or masonic? What is it? We don't know. But he does mention that. So when I thought I had invented artificial matter, I'm wrong. We go back and Stapledon invented it. If we think that Will McCarthy's programmable matter, he's got a patent on that, is brand new with him, well, programmable matter, perhaps. But artificial matter goes back to Stapledon. When he got around to writing Star Maker, at this point, you've got to kind of shake your head and say, what was he thinking? That's a history of the entire universe, including a meeting with the Star Maker, his version of God, 
And as if that isn't enough, after covering all these vast spaces of time and living galaxies and all sorts of things going on, the last few chapters are the earlier universes, the more sort of amateur works created by God, the star maker, and the later, more advanced universes that come after ours. Just describes in the last few chapters. That's probably the most imaginative form of writing in the 20th century. So I think I compare him to our modern Dante. And, you know, not, not really in the moralistic sense, but just that he was the most imaginative writer of his time. And science fiction writers have been stealing from all of these guys ever since, but most especially from Olaf Stapledon. So whenever you read an Arthur C. Clarke novel, you're looking at a, a, a not-so-illegitimate son of Olaf Stapledon carrying on this material and passing it along in stories like Childhood's End, and, uh, and eventually it has a heavy influence on the film 2001, A Space Odyssey, the last segments of the film, a far visionary look at, at what alien intelligence could be like and what they might want to do to us. But along the way, I think what you saw with these visionaries was an attempt to almost secularize the mythic imagination, the, the religious imagination, to take religious experience away from the mythic and put it into a scientific context. How could you have an intellectual high, like an epiphany, from just reading a story that was about the future or about places you've never been? And they managed to do that. Arthur, uh, Arthur Clarke in particular was very, very good at creating that, that m sort of intellectual high. So this was what I was raised on. It totally perverted me when I was a kid. And over the years, most of my science fiction has kind of fallen into that category. Recently, I've been going back and doing biology, so Darwin's radio, starting almost uh, 10 years ago now, is a heavy-duty attempt to tell biologists where they need to be looking. Fortunately, it's still up to date today, nine years later, so I don't feel the need to go back and revise it. I've done all that. I've warned people about as much as I can about biology, so now it's time to go back to my youth and have a ball. So City at the End of Time is an attempt not to tell biologists how to get things right, but physicists who have been taking themselves entirely too seriously recently. I mean, string theory predicts, you know, two to the 500th different universes, pick one. Okay? But we don't know how to test it. It's mathematically gorgeous. Mathematics, we know, has a certain spiritual platonic essence which elevates it above all other human disciplines, et cetera, et cetera. And so, therefore, it, if it, because it's mathematically beautiful, it must be true. Well, I have my doubts. So I think I'm going back here and pointing out a number of, of um, problems with the mathematical interpretation of nature, starting with the biological interpretation. This leads me into my universal library, library of Babel, complete library thing. We've been told in school that the genome can only evolve randomly. Random mutations, this is the idea from the 1920s and 30s, basically. Random mutations only, no directedness, no planning, nothing like this is allowed. So you have a single mutation in a codon creating a mutation in uh, an amino acid or a protein. Bang. Okay. Now, there are three billion codons in the human genome. So, three billion. That's an alphabet being mutated across a string of a certain length. Now, if you actually figure the numbers out, and I haven't because I don't want to, actually figure the size of that number out, it's astonishing. It would take a huge number of universes of our supposed universe's lifespan to even begin to explore that phase space. So how does that work? Well, they don't work it out. Literally, it's a given. It's a faith item. The fact is that practically it just doesn't make sense. So how do I have fun with this? By taking an actual theoretical universal library and saying, why don't you believe in this? So here's the universal library. For Borges, in his essay, The Library of Babel, it was 24 letters in an alphabet, 420-some pages, and, uh, you know, mm, however many volumes it would take to fill out all those permutations. And it was huge. I think in the Wikipedia page on the Library of Babel, you can see that actual number. It's enormous. Now, we're afraid of very, very large numbers. We kind of quail at them, but we love infinities. We just absolutely adore. We can work with infinities, but large numbers, <laughs> that's sort of in between. They're messy. Very, very large numbers. In this book, the history of the universe, the fate of the universe depends on a library of Babel. So along the way, there are a lot of puzzles. There are a lot of, uh, of um, notions, but also there's an organic view of physics which 
I think is more convincing than the certain parallel, perpendicular mathematical view of physics that we have today. Alternate universes, multiverses. String theory has recently said, well, we kind of invented this. No, you didn't. It goes back to before H.G. Wells, actually. A lot of science fiction in the 20s was talking of alternate dimensions and you know parallel worlds and things like that. By the time Hugh Everett actually put these ideas together, yeah, it was, it was more formalized, but still a pretty science fictional idea. So now we have quantum computing, which relies upon the existence of parallel worlds to get its work done. <laughs> My own metaphor comes alive here. So in, in this alternate universe, they're much smarter than we are, and they can solve our problems for us, and that's why quantum computing works. <laughs> Having all this fun along the way, I have to tell a story, of course, and the story takes us back to the real British visionary science fiction, which was for a, a book by William Hope Hodgson called The Nightland. You have a story set in a, uh, I think, an 18th century setting to start with. Then it turns out that their parallel lives are in the very, very far future. And those parallel lives take them to the last redoubt, which is a city hundreds of millions of years in the future, surrounded by what Hodgson believes, I think, is like an evolutionary montage of monstrosities. He didn't regard them as being supernatural, but when you read the book, they're so nightmarishly original and creative that you have to think there's something more going on here than just science. And there's a lot of kind of metaphysical speculations along the way. A wonderful book, almost impossible to read, because he wrote it in this pseudo-William Morris romantic style. And he may have written it when he was like 18 or 19 years old. We don't know. I don't know for sure. But it reads like a young novel written by an utterly brilliant guy. That novel was probably read by, among others, J.R.R. Tolkien. But here's a parallel wrapped around British history, European history. The Nightland, as described by Hodgson, has this weird evocative power, the surrounding dark landscape around the last redoubt, this huge pyramid of human, the last surviving remnants of humanity, very much resembles the trench warfare of World War I. So it's as if Hodgson is precognizing, precognizing what's going to be happening to him. And in fact, he dies in World War I at the Battle of Ypres in 1916. Tolkien is in World War I. What he writes about in The Lord of the Rings as Mordor is very like the trenches in World War I, but also harks back to some of the aspects of the Nightland. So World War I, the trenches, the nightmare, the death of the upper classes, the death of literary classes, the traumatizing effect on all of Europe, is both presaged and then artistically interpreted, flanked by two major works of fantasy. Tolkien asked us never to take these as metaphors for like World War II, but he never said much about the trenches in World War I, which he, I think, really strongly influenced this. But when you see the, um, the Peter Jackson version of Lord of the Rings, and you see the great eye sweeping across the landscape, sending its beams across the landscape, that is straight out of the nightland. So I think the crossover there is clear. Also, this connection between the past and the future. Stapledon does that too. He sends minds from the past back into the future. There's a kind of a parallel notion here that they're going to come back and talk to us. Now, we don't quite have that communication in Clark, but we do have a city at the end of time in Diaspar and City in the Stars. And Diaspar is surrounded by this vast desert, and uh, the last remnants of humanity are here, and the rest of the universe, humanity has shrunken away from the rest of the universe in horror at having encountered something in the far distance, which it turns out is called the Mad Mind. And that's very Hodgsonian, too. So all of this science fiction comes from origins that predate World War I, but are shaped by World War I. H.G. Wells, of course, was writing about World War I before it ever happened. He wrote The Land Ironclads, The War in the Air. In 1914, he was working on a book called The World Set Free, which I believe was published in 1915. In The World Set Free, he describes an atomic bomb, a fusion, a, a fission weapon, that can, in fact, destroy an entire city and is used on Berlin in this novel. Well, of course, we know that the World War II nuclear weapons were first designed to be dropped on Berlin. And they were used on Japan because Germany capitulated first. So all of this stuff, this far future being tied into the traumas of the present is classic science fiction psychology. It's how we all think. In this case, I'm taking those classical elements and 
throwing them in with a little bit of Lewis Carroll and a couple of questions, which I'll now pose to you. At Google, you really have the problem of finding interesting stuff in a giant, complete library of nonsense. Right? That's what search is all about. How much of this stuff makes any sense to anybody? You can't take time to interpret that. So in a library of Babel, imagine how many of these volumes are going to be complete nonsense from your point of view. And how many of them can you discard as complete nonsense from any point of view? How do you analyze them so that they have meaning? How do you reduce your problems severely? How do you get a solution to finding anything in what Gregory Benford once described to me as noise. So this is your first question. What is the difference between a pattern of noise and a complete library? What's the constraints for a complete library? Well, I'm not sure what that means either. You see, we're getting into pretty abstruse questions here. What do we mean by entropy when we're talking about a, 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 set, a pattern set of, of strings? Useful. We care about useful, but how do we know what's useful? Well, language. language. Right. You don't understand it, but it might be like heretical in another language. Yeah. Language. Right, right. Right. Well, that's if you bring it. You know, we're we're going to talk about this in a mathematical sort of nerd like way instead of going after it like Inquisition. But Borges' essay is magnificent this way because, of course, it describes the human approach to any massive volume of information. But the first question, you guys got to get this fast, because last time I was here, they got it in like, you know, three, three minutes or less. <laughs> Difference between noise and the library, yeah. Right. Okay. And that's, that's actually kind of a different expression of the fact that noise is allowed to repeat itself. The universal library is not. Creating the universal library, that's not a trivial problem. How can you avoid creating the same string set over and over again? There must be some way, some algorithm of generating a unique string set every single time. And if you don't have that, then you just have noise. But let's say you manage to find that, and so you're not allowed to repeat. So within a bounded period of time, the universal library is not infinite. It's just very, very large, enormously large. What percentage of the universal library is going to be nonsensical? Right, but how do we know? How do we know? Because it looks like codons are nonsensical. And we, you know, for years we've been taking apart the genome and saying these things over here, these are just random bits of crap. And they're all junk DNA. That phrase is very seldom used by anyone who's younger than 50 now. If you have a biologist older than 50, they may still slip into this. This was the paradigm at one time that if we don't understand it, it's just junk. Well, now it turns out that probably 99% of it is it being used for something, some purpose, it's a very highly condensed language set of some sort. So how do we know that isn't true of the universal library? It's an insoluble problem in a lot of respects, but how do you cut your problem in half looking for meaningful stuff? It's a very simple solution. Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, you, that's a very good point. You have to, you're only going to be able to understand those languages that, that you can understand, that you can interpret. So are you going to go for a theoretical language, or are you going to go for a mathematical solution, an algorithm that cuts your problem in half? And what's the algorithm? It's very simple. One half of the library will be a mirror of the other half. You just cut it in half and use one side, because they'll both be reflective of each other, wherever you go. Now, it's not going to be created in a mirror situation, so the way of, of figuring out what a mirror string is and whether that doesn't make sense, your palindromic strings or whatever, whether they're going to make the same sort of message system as the others, that's another theoretical problem. What is not going to be in the universal library? Well, complete expression of pi will not be in there or any, you know, generally random number. But do we know that pi is a random number? It hasn't been proven yet. People pointed out on my website as I was discussing this a couple of years ago, they said, well, you just, you can't prove that, you don't know that. However, you can't zip pi. You've got a, you know, trillion string, a, a trillion digit expression of pi, 
and try and zip it, what do you get? You get, it's, it's 100%. I mean, it's, you can't zip it down at all. There's a clue. When you have a very noisy JPEG in your camera, it expands in size. It's larger than a less noisy picture because you don't have an algorithm in your camera that tells you, well, this stuff doesn't mean anything. We can eliminate it. That's what the noise reduction is for. And basically, the noise reduction also reduces useful information. You're not allowed to do that in the Universal Library. So if you have a very large, incompressible thing, it's less likely to be meaningful than one that you can compress. Now, of course, you've got you know, all zeros, all ones, that sort of thing. But those are, in fact, less entropic than other string sets. So this is the problem faced by my godlike character in City at the End of Time. Now, you only meet him toward the end of the book. And along the way, we have Seattle, contemporary Seattle. And if you found the website, you can see parts of the Seattle that we've actually put into the book um, being dismantled. Because it turns out that when the universe gets old and decides to decay and die, it doesn't just go happen at the end. It starts from the beginning as well. If you have a five-dimensional universe, there it goes. Yeah? Yeah. I didn't. I went 100 trillion years into the future. Because I think I think I think I make the point that what we consider the heat death of the universe is just the beginning. You know, if we got technological solutions, the fact is we may consider it to be a singularity and there are things right here that people in this room can't explain about technology, so those are singularity horizons for you. I'm not so sure I'm fond of this whole idea that the entire human race will be incapable of understanding its surroundings. Because business opportunists and entrepreneurs are going to merge with the power bases that create those impossible knowledge horizons, and they're going to then understand them. And that's what happened throughout entire bits of human history. If you bring someone from Leonardo's time into our day, into this room, this is all a singularity. Just forget it. Because for one thing, all knowledge is biological. It's not a spiritual angelic thing that's suspended out there and accessible only to mathematicians and, and nerds like you and me. No, knowledge is being cooked. When you acquire knowledge, you're like the cooking of an egg. Your brain is being cooked. You are being set into a certain pattern that you will change your behaviors by acquiring this knowledge. If it's useful to you, you will keep it. It'll change your brain's morphology. Bang, singularities. Not so sure I'm convinced by them. But as far as why we do it, we do it because it's fun. You know, and when you set something 100 trillion years in the future, you then have to overcome this fact that no one understands what's going to happen that far in the future. So it's like describing the gods in Hindu religion. It's not this, not that. It becomes a poetic expression. And that's fun, too. But along the way, we can have fun with our own, our own misconceptions about science. So in this one, I've had a fair amount of fun, gotten some pretty decent reactions from around the world. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, whether there can ever be a sequel to a book like this, I have no idea. But the whole point of it is, in terms of the metaphysics, that everything you know is wrong. Which is the quote we got from the Fire Sign Theater in the beginning of the book. Now, we got a lot of other puzzles here, but uh, <laughs> you have any questions so far about what we're getting into? And if you've seen the website, you know that we're having an awful lot of fun with the special effects side of it, too. Good question. Uh, as uh, John Dewey says, everything we are comes clothed in culture. Uh, and that's why the singularity question is so interesting and kind of, um, it's more of a question for students than a metaphysical limitation. Um, our culture is very upper brain. We have a very hard time understanding certain things, for example, like our connection to biology. We think of ourselves as angelic. We think of mathematics as an angelic power supply that, that allows us access to almost platonic realms of existence. In fact, all of these things are all biological functions. We don't do anything that's outside of biology. Or if we do, and I'm not saying that, that it's not possible that we do, if we do, science can't analyze that. But we're a scientific culture. So how do you access those singularities that go beyond what science can teach us? I don't know. 
But if you take the basic scientific principle, mathematics is a biological function. It's done by biological systems. The results change the physiology of biological beings. So culture is biology. Politics is biology. There was a time, you know, even like 10, 12 years ago, when you talk to sociologists and they would say, no way, no way. You know, biology is totally different from culture, totally different from sociology. But economics is biology, too. I think that's all becoming very, very clear now. It's what affects you in your physiology, in your chemistry, and how you then become more useful to your social system or your culture. That's the whole stream of knowledge and history and science and everything else for us. So that's a very good question. We've all just eaten, haven't we? <laughs> and I had a brownie, too. So what's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quantico is uh, basically, you know, trying to warn people about the current situation. And in this one, I'm just having fun tweaking physicists. I love physics. I love physicists. I love to get together with people like Freeman Dyson and, and whoever else happens to show up and, and talk about these things. And, you know, starting 15 years ago, Freeman said, well, you know, physics is one of the least interesting areas of science right now. Astronomy, cosmology, biology are where it's at. And uh, I still think that's the case, actually. We've gotten too, uh, too ground up. So the other, the other notion that, that kind of stands behind all of this is can you describe the universe using mathematical language? I don't think so. I think that there's too many degrees of freedom, and every time you try to take a very complicated problem and reduce it to an equation, you lose too much, and you start getting feedback whine from your reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does, except that that's been interpreted 18 different ways, and mathematicians are still insisting on the theory of everything. They haven't been paying attention to Mr. Gödel. But biologists are still doing that. When we put together the petaflops computer or thought about it back in the 90s, now we have it, they said, well, this will help solve you know, protein movements. It doesn't. You've got a protein with so many degrees of freedom moving through so many cycles, you know, 60,000 cycles in a minute or whatever, or 10,000 cycles per second. That's can, it cannot be modeled even by a petaflops computer. We have computer systems now that every time you boot them up, for whatever reason, they don't boot up the same way twice. Okay? So my question for all those who, who kind of think about moving into the silicon age, what's the oldest computer you know of? Still working, never turned off. And it's still running? Yeah. Do you have, you have any, any, any hints? Yeah. Yes, yeah, don't hit well, no, no. Calculators don't count. <laughs> no, computers now, mathematically based Turing machines, how many of those <clears throat> are still running? Biological systems are by far the most reliable. Some of them have been around for several thousand years. You know, if you talk of, of bacteria as being a continuous tissue moving through the the Earth for thousands of years, millions of billions of years, then it beats us all out. So why do we want to move into silica? Because silicon doesn't decay. That's that upper brain thing again. If you lose me, you lose the most important part of the universe. How well, solipsistic is that? Yeah. Well, I think we are getting to the point where we think about computers as a dynamic system instead of an object. Mm. Especially if you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we want to make the computer do things that can survive that kind of failure. Right. So it's not just substituting an object, but dynamically possible. Mm -hmm. Which is much more biological. Very much more. It's not a Turing machine anymore. Yeah, you, know, you don't boot the same tape up twice. No, no. We've always had to kludge in one way or another. And the other thing is, you have, you know, you have a computer running a long mathematical problem, and then the programmer comes and takes the tape over to the next computer to continue it that's no longer a Turing machine. But that's the way programming has always worked. There's never been a Turing machine. There's never been a mathematical way to describe the universe, two parts of the same problem. Because a computer can't describe proteins, computer can't describe physics, computer can't describe the universe, neither can any of the people working on string theory. You get beautiful stuff, 
It's very interesting. It's like fractals. You know, fractals are things that look really interesting for about an hour, and then you start getting bored. And when they say that fractals are like coastlines or whatever, they're not really. You know, in Google Earth, you can look at a coastline, and it, up to a point it looks sort of fractal, and you're getting closer and closer and closer, and it just falls apart. So mathematics has always been the queen of the sciences. It's not going to help us solve the end of the universe or find out where the singularity is or what we need to know next. We've come up, up against a brick wall, and I don't know how to go around it, which is all of science is based upon mathematics, but the only way to solve these metaphysical questions, these not even metaphysical, but just physical questions, is through natural language, which is what the Universal Library is all about. Now, what's in the Universal Library is huge volumes of stuff we can't begin to understand. But pi is not in there. But is the Universal Library contained in pi? I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't know. You can get 10 mathematicians and get 20 different answers. A description of pi, how to generate pi, would be in there many, many different times. Most of them wrong, of course. That's the other problem about the universal library, just like life. You know, most of the stuff you find in the library is totally not useful to you. But is the universal library contained in the string suffix of pi? I remember back when Carl Sagan put that into contact, that there was a message contained in pi. And all the mathematicians jumped all over him. And they said, it's totally random. But what word in all of mathematics and physics has never been adequately described? Randomness. It's a here there be tigers sort of thing. Yeah. You would think it is. OK. Then you've got a universal library in pi. That means pi contains meaning. Except using the techniques I've just elucidated for you. Find those parts of pi that can be compressed. That probably means generating it to, you know, 10 to the 1 millionth digits. But that's just a very large number. That's not infinity. I mean, Borges talks about that, too. And, and all of this stuff takes us into the origins of language, you know, how we mathematically analyze language and everything. Point is that we just have great fun, as did Lewis Carroll when he was writing his stories. Yeah. So it seems to me that it would make it easier to write the book you're looking for than to find it in the library. Right. <laughs> but you have to create a universe to do that. But how long will it take you to find it? Well, I, what I'm trying to say is, by the time you can specify what you're looking for in enough precision to find it, you've already answered the question. Right. But you need to create a universe to do that. Well, you can just have an imaginary library. Let's pretend we have a library. Yeah. How would we search it with sufficient precision to find the answer we want? Well, once you find your search, query string, or whatever, well, that's your answer, because otherwise right. you would find Right. Right. You don't actually need the library because you have the book that negates the thing you're looking for and reinforces the thing you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That might only just change by a couple characters. But useful information is only that which is surprising. Well, so you're searching for stuff that's useful that's surprising. You can find stuff you already know. That's kind of what, you know, what, what small libraries are good for. Well, if you find something that's surprising, you'll have no way of knowing what to do at Which is true of life. Exactly. And I, I think that's sort of, well, I don't see any, what, what's the usefulness of the universal library? You can't find anything unless, you can't find anything true unless you already knew it was true. And everything else that you found is surprising. You have no way of knowing if it's true or not. That's true of science, too. Okay. Well, you have to put it into a context. That's so what's the universal library lack? All context. It has no context whatsoever. 
It's a pure abstraction. How do you bring the universal library to life? You create a universe. At which point, look how we've described the universe. The universe is a huge statistically describable, vaguely statistically describable conglomeration of random processes describable by you know, gas theory, physics, so on, pretty simply describable. But the implications of it are vast. You have billions of galaxies, hundreds of trillions of stars. You have all of these things, and let's say 30% of them have living functions of some sort around them, or some sort of complicated physical process going on. Now, how are you going to describe that in a human lifetime? You can't, but it's all in the universal library. And every single possible alternative, including those that never happened in this universe. But the universe is made up of an infinite number of multiples of itself, which fan out. That's the quantum mechanics requirement, right? So, wait, wait. within language, it does. Yeah. Well, doesn't contain pi either. As in all literature, or a language in general. Language is never precise. But you're right, you're right. The thing is, if you have infinite universes, where any multitude of universes would be so close together that so almost identical that you describe the differences between you would run out of room in your infinite universal library to describe all possibilities. You never describe everything. You only describe that which is useful. The context is its expansion, which is the secret of the book. I'm just giving you this, the spoiler for the book. I'm sorry. Now, anyway, you probably won't even recognize it when you read the book. But the, the truth is, the universal library is a metaphor for all of our theories of science with regards to cosmology and human origins and everything else. We have used all of these mathematical abstractions. We've used all of these things to describe basic processes. When the clockwork universe comes from Leibniz sitting there and saying, if you know the state of every single particle in a system, including the universe, and know what direction it's going in and what its energy level is, you will know the subsequent state of the system. Therefore, oh, well, that's easy, they said. That's great. That means that the universe is mechanical and can be predicted and mathematically described. Yes. How? Of course, now with quantum mechanics, we don't say that anymore. But back in the day when the clockwork universe, which is still like a major metaphor for all of science, comes into play, it turns out it's based upon a, a fantasy, an impossible fantasy. Maxwell's demon. You guys know why Maxwell's demon doesn't work. This is the thing that sits at the gate between hot and cold, or energetic and lower energy, and picks the particles out that are higher energy and puts them into a certain trap. What's the metaphysical problem with Maxwell's demon? It's an input-output situation. It requires energy to process this information. Therefore, Maxwell's demon is part of the system, and so on and so on and so on. Whenever we come up with the Gedanken experiments that are scientific, because we're upper brain thinkers, we come up with these abstractions, these science fiction metaphysical abstractions will then shape our entire approach to science. Now, how amazing is that? And then we get defensive when we're called on them. So, okay, Einstein says, you know, we don't play dice with the universe. And is it Niels Bohr says, you know, Albert, don't tell God what to do. <laughs> Which is kind of what science has been doing. If you have a universal library, how is that any more or less practical than a theory of everything that condenses all of metaphysics and science and physics into a single equation? A small one, we hope. An infinite long equation just won't be useful. That's what we've been searching for, the theory of everything. And E equals MC squared that will describe all of the complexity we see around us, from which all of this stuff will flow, kind of like Borges' Aleph in his story, the Aleph. Well, that's, that's a numerological philosophy. The Aleph is based upon Hebrew myth, which is, you know, part of this whole thing about the Bible studies and so on. So how is it any more impractical to conjure up and talk about a universal library than talk about Leibniz's theories or all these other theories, or the theory of everything. Which is more likely to generate our universe? A single small equation or a huge library filled with random things? Especially if you have a multiverse. So I think we've just about exceeded our lunchtime limit here. <laughs>
But I had a lot of fun doing this. And along the way, none of this is visible to most of the people reading the book. This is just sort of the underpinnings, like Lewis Carroll's vision. This underpins my story, which is about pushing a, a randomly digested bit of the 21st century, 100 trillion years into the future, and matching up to find out how the universe really does come to an end, which is not in the neat, tidy way you would think. And along the way, if you get too bold and too interested in living forever, you can cause problems for your offspring all the way back to the beginning of time. So it's a moral tale. A comedy, a moral tale, a little bit of a metaphysical tale, and embedded somewhere in there are all these questions which I do not have the answers for. So sometime next week you can send me them. I'll put them on my website, send me the answers. One more question, then shall we sit down and sign books? Right. Well, it's infinitely long. The library is not infinite. That's true. But how, how would you make pi an integer? Right. You do. And the, our universe, our real universe, could be derived from putting the universal library into a matrix where it's, it expands outward like sea monkeys. So maybe the universal library is the seed of universes. Since pi is, is contained within it only in seed form, perhaps the rest of the universe is too. So the context becomes all this wonderful stuff we see around us, rather than just a simple theory of everything. But it's all very good points. And the other, the other question is, that can you then take all of those numbers that are obviously in the universal library and continuously rearrange them to create pi? Very likely. Like a brick maker, you could stack it up as long as you cared to, which is how we generate pi now. We never see the whole thing. But these are all very good, very good points and very good questions. Obviously, I've reached my singularity, <laughs> beyond which I can only write novels. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, let's sign some books. <laughs>